Hello everybody, welcome to my studio. Hopefully you're all having amazing creative days. So today we're gonna to be talking about the EOS R5 and more specifically, the menu settings I have set up on my camera for my photography work. Now, this is a pretty awesome camera and if you're watching this video, I assume you probably just picked up an R5 recently. So congratulations to you. This is a pretty awesome camera. I pre-ordered this when it first came out and it had some flaws, but right there is a video on how to update your firmware. So if you haven't done that yet, make sure you update the firmware to the latest firmware because when this camera came out, photography was pretty solid on this camera, but Canon did release firmware that gave it some more enhanced autofocus features. It also kind of got rid of that overheating and video mode and some other things. So it's definitely worth it to upgrade the firmware, do that first, and then come back to this video and uh, we'll talk about the menu settings. All right, so let's jump into the menu. We have the screen recorder going. Let's get the spectacles on and let's jump into it. Okay, so first things first. All right, so image quality, I shoot raw plus small JPEG and this is the smallest, crappiest size JPEG. You definitely don't wanna be shooting JPEG with the R5. You certainly can if you want, but if your interest is not to shoot raw and you wanna shoot JPEG, invest in another camera system. This is just too much money for shooting JPEG. You might as well take full advantage of this beautiful sensor in this camera. I keep it on small JPEG so that when I up, usually when I upload these files to my computer, I'll delete the JPEGs, I'll take the raw files, I'll process them and I'll export a bunch of proof JPEGs, which I send to the client. I pop up onto a cloud server or something, G Drive. I shoot small JPEGs simply in the, in the case that I don't have time to process the shots or maybe I'll just take the small JPEGs right out of camera and send them to the client so they can have proofs right away. And it saves me money and it's easy to delete. It doesn't take up a lot of space, so I just leave it on. I certainly wouldn't shoot large JPEG or anything like that. Not that the quality isn't good on this camera, it's just that if you have this camera, you wanna be shooting raw. Next up, we have something called Dual Pixel Raw, and a whole video can be dedicated to this. So I'm just gonna give you the Coles notes. I don't use it, I keep it on disabled. So each photo site, each pixel on the camera has a left and a right side. And if you shoot Dual Pixel Raw, what happens is the camera will actually shoot two raw images, one from the perspective of the pixels on this side and one from the perspective of pixels on that side. And what you can do in post-processing is you can kind of adjust how blurry the background is. You can kind of adjust the lighting on a face. You have a little more exposure control, just a teensy bit of exposure control in post. But the issue with that is you have to use Canon's proprietary, was it digital something? I, I forget the name, I'll put it down here, but you have to use Canon's proprietary software to do that. So that's just another step in the workflow. So you should do a pixel, then you have to upload to the Canon converter. And then if you want to use your presets and stuff in Lightroom or Capture One, then you have to upload it to there. And it just, it just takes too much time. It's not worth it. But if that's something you're interested in, definitely Google it. There's a lot of information on there. Okay, so next up we have cropping aspect ratio. So full means you're shooting an image with the full sensor. 1.6 is the APS-C crop. So if you're using an EFS lens or an RFS lens on the front of your R5, it'll automatically go into 1.6 crop. But if you have like a regular RF lens or EF lens on your camera, third party lens, whatever the case may be, if you set it to 1.6, it'll actually crop in on the sensor and give you that 1.6 crop. So let's say you're shooting birds or sports and you want a little extra range on your lens, you want it to go a little further, you can set it to 1.6 and it'll crop in on the sensor. But you can also just shoot a full size image and then crop and post. It doesn't really make much of a difference. The other thing to keep in mind here is that if you're shooting one by one, four by three, 16 by nine, you'll see the crop in the camera viewfinder or LCD. But when you load these images up into let's say Lightroom, the images will be cropped in Lightroom, but if you go into the Lightroom crop feature, you can expand it back into the full image. So the important thing to note here is that the camera will record the image at the full size sensor readout and you can uncrop it in post. If you're shooting RAW, if you're shooting JPEG, obviously the crop happens in camera. So that's just something to keep in mind. I usually keep my camera in full all the time, unless I'm shooting a YouTube thumbnail, in which case I go to 16 by nine and that allows me to compose my shot and uh, see what it's gonna look like in camera as a thumbnail. ISO speed settings. Now this is important. Right now ISO is set to auto. So this top one is your ISO speed. So if you go out of the camera into shooting mode and you wanna change your ISO speed, it's the same thing here, right? So we can change it here if we go into the menu, ISO speed settings. ISO speed range is if you're changing the ISO manually in your camera. So you can set, uh, let's say I set my, my lowest, <laughs> ISO speed, I don't know why they call it speed, it's ISO sensitivity in my mind, but anyway, I can set my <laughs> lowest ISO sensitivity to 3200. So now, if I hit okay, boom, and I go out here to shoot, I can't see because it's recorder, but yeah, 
The lowest ISO I could go to is now 3200, which is just not what you want. So let's go in here. So basically you can set the ISO range that you operate at. L is 50, obviously, and then you can set your maximum. So obviously the higher you go, the more grainy you get. So let's say you're shooting a wedding and you don't want, you don't want to accidentally get to 51,000 ISO. You can actually drop this down and say, oh, maximum ISO I want this camera to be able to go to is 3200. There you go. So now, okay, and we're out. Now we have auto range. And this is really cool too, if you have your ISO set to auto. So if you're shooting like aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, and you set your ISO to auto, you can tell your camera, okay, if you're in auto, don't go higher than 12,800, which is what I have it set to here. You can obviously change that and do whatever you want, but I find that like anything beyond that's too much, or even if you want, you can set it to 1600. So now you're telling the camera, if you're in auto mode, don't go or only operate between 100 and 1600 and don't go beyond those. So, I mean, that's pretty cool, right? I'm gonna set it back to 128 so I don't forget. And okay, so that's pretty cool. And then minimum shutter speed. So you can change the minimum shutter speed. I have it set to 1 25th of a second. So when I'm in auto mode, it's not gonna drop below that. Obviously, if you have like everything set to auto and the camera's picking the shutter speed, it might pick one second and there you are hand holding, <laughs> taking a one second exposure. And this thing has IBIS, but one second, you're probably gonna get a blurry shot. All right, so let's get out of here. Auto lighting optimizer. So this setting will basically lower your highlights and increase your shadows to create a more flat image. However, the one thing to keep in mind with auto lighting optimizer, it, is, it only affects JPEGs. And obviously you're shooting with an R5, you don't wanna be shooting JPEGs, so that is off. Now, here's the other thing, we have highlight tone priority. You can't have highlight tone priority on and auto lighting optimizer on. It's either one or the other. If one of them's on, the other one has to be off. Highlight tone priority will affect JPEGs and RAW. So that's why I have this on, it's set to D plus and there's enhanced as well. All right, so this is how highlight tone priority works and this is why I turn it on on my camera. So what it does is it preserves details in the highlights. So if you're shooting, let's say a wedding and the bride's in a white dress, the groom's in a black tux, obviously that's an extreme amount of contrast. And if you're shooting outdoors in sunlight, chances of you overexposing that bride's dress are pretty high. Chances of you overexposing the sky is pretty high. So enabling highlight tone priority will tell the camera to preserve details in the highlights. Now, there's two downsides to using this setting. One is your shadows are gonna be a little noisier, no big deal. You can always clean that up in post-production. You know, it's easier to clean up noise in the shadows in Lightroom than it is to bring back blown out skies or blown out details in a dress. So that's why that's on. The other caveat with this is that you cannot shoot lower than ISO 200. So if you wanna shoot ISO 50 or 100, forget about it, it's not gonna happen. So if you are shooting with highlight tone priority on, using a polarizing filter or ND filter on the front of your camera, just a light ND filter and a polarizing filter is a light ND filter. Those are recommended. That's a little trick, a little advanced trick if you don't do that. So yeah, that's something you can do. I usually keep highlight tone priority on. So let's get out of there. Anti-flicker shooting. So if you're shooting in a sports arena and the lights are flickering and you can see these bands of light, dark, light, dark on your image, you wanna turn that on. External speed light control. That's a setting I'm not gonna get into here, but obviously if you have a speed light on your camera, that's a whole video in itself. You can control it through the menu. White balance. I personally find Canon's white balance to be spot on pretty much all the time. So I keep it on auto white balance. Obviously you can change it. You have all your different white balances here. So if you're shooting under fluorescent lights, you set it to fluorescent. If you're shooting under tungsten lights, you set it to tungsten. You can do custom white balance, which in case you would shoot a picture of something that's white or gray, and then you would go into this custom white balance and you would set it. Clearly if you're buying an R5, you know how to do this. And then here you can just manually dial in. And here's where you set your custom white balance. There's no card in the camera. There's no image to set it to, but that's where you would go. White balance shift. So if you want more red in your shots, you want more blue, you want more green, you want more purple, you can set everything here. I just keep it to neutral, but I mean, if you're trying to create a specific effect, if you want things to look a little more bluish or reddish or pinkish or whatever, you can, uh, you can set that in here. Color space, you have sRGB, Adobe RGB. I keep it to sRGB all the time. Picture style, I just keep it on faithful. You have three user-defined picture styles, so you can go in here. So you can go in here and you can set your sharpness strength, you can set your uh, finesse, threshold, contrast, saturation, and just keep in mind that all these settings here affect the JPEG, not the RAW. So if you're shooting something for a client and you want it to look really good on a camera, really sharp, you want the colors to be this way, contrasty, 
blah, 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 monochrome, whatever you want. You can set them up here in your standard and it'll affect your JPEG, not your RAW. Obviously RAW is just the RAW output from the camera. I've always just kept it on Facebook. And there it is, Clarity. Again, this will affect your JPEG, not your RAW. If I'm wrong about that, let me know in the comments below, but I believe this only affects the JPEGs. Keep it on zero because I don't use JPEGs. Lens aberration correction. Now this is important. Now peripheral illuminator correction. So if you have, if you're using a lens and now keep in mind that these corrections only work on modern lenses. The older lenses, Canon's older lenses, it does put that lens correction information into the firmware in the camera. But usually when you plug uh, like, or attach a modern lens onto the camera, it has the information already in the lens and it communicates that to the camera and the camera will make the adjustments in camera. So right now we have the RF 24 to 105 on here. So if there's any vignette in my shots, it'll correct it in camera, distortion correction. Now I'm not sure if this applies to the raw file or if it just puts that data in the EXIF data for the raw file. And then when you load it into Lightroom or Capture One, the adjustments will happen on your computer. There's Digital Lens Optimizer, which allows the camera to optimize the image for whatever lens. And this is, I think, a more advanced way of doing it, but this only affects the JPEG and it only affects the raw if you're using Canon's proprietary raw editor. So. I obviously don't use it, so I keep that off. Chromatic abrasion correction, diffraction correction. I leave all of these ones off. I just leave digital lens optimizer off because it only works with the Canon program. Usually I don't have any issues. I know some lenses like the Canon 16 millimeter F2.8 RF, that lens has some wonky distortion and without in-camera correction, when you pop that lens or photos from that lens onto your computer, everything's gonna look super stretched. So you definitely wanna keep these things on. You can turn it off if you want to see what the lens looks like without all the corrections, if you want. All right, so next we have long exposure noise reduction. I keep this off because I don't really shoot long exposures and I don't really shoot in the dark, but if you're doing, let's say, astro trails and shooting in the dark, long exposures, that kind of thing, you can turn it on. Sometimes I keep it on auto if, I'm not, if I don't know what's going on, if I'm shooting at sunset or something, but usually just off. High ISO noise reduction, leave it on standard. Although I could just leave it on low because I don't really shoot in low light, but uh, you can set up your camera however you shoot. Dust delete data. I've never actually used this. I, uh, if I have dust on my sensor, I usually just spot heal it. But <laughs> I'll tell you this, because the R5 has this feature, which we're gonna talk about when we get there, you can actually close the shutter when the camera's off, so you wait for the shutter to close, then you change your lenses. And I've only got dust on this camera, I don't know, once or twice since it came out. And uh, yeah, I love that feature in Canon cameras. I personally would not want to buy a camera that doesn't have that shutter down feature unless that camera offers something really special that <laughs> I can't get with a Canon camera. But yeah, it's an awesome feature in camera, HDR mode. So here we go. HDR mode basically, it shoots three images, an underexposed, an overexposed, and a properly exposed image, and then it kind of stitches them together in camera, and you'll get a JPEG with a really high dynamic range. The only issue with this is you can't shoot anything that's moving. It's kind of like shooting with that new feature that um, pixel shift, or what is it called? Uh, Ibis shift, whatever Canon calls it. If, if, if you have things moving in your frame, when the camera takes the three exposures, if the things are in different positions in the frame because they're moving while it's taking the shots, it's gonna create a wonky HDR effect. So you wanna shoot things that aren't moving at all, like still lifes. The place where I use HDR mode is when I shoot real estate. So if I'm shooting the interior of a house, I'll shoot in, in HDR mode and it'll just bring up the shadows, bring down the, the highlights and just kind of make everything neutral. And then in Photoshop, I can edit that JPEG and make the darks darker if I want or just play around with it. But yeah, when you're shooting real estate, this is a great thing. Otherwise, eh, I don't really use it much. Focus bracketing, which is also called focus stacking on other systems. So what you can do is let's say you're shooting, I don't know, let's say you're shooting a, a, an object that's kind of long and if you, your depth of field isn't big enough to cover the whole objects, what you'll do is shoot it with, with focus here, then shoot it with focus here, then shoot it with focus here. And in Photoshop, you'll stitch them all together so the whole object is in focus. So that's the setting for that. You turn this on, you, you select the number of shots, you set, set the focus increments and stuff like that. I personally don't use this, but uh, if you wanna play around with it, I'm sure there's some videos on YouTube, or if you want me to make a video talking about this, I can go and experiment with it, learn how to use it, and make a video and teach you how to use it. I guess if you're shooting product photography or macro stuff, this would be super helpful. 
Next up, we got interval timer. So if you want to do like a time lapse kind of thing, you can shoot multiple shots. You can tell the camera, shoot one photo every minute, every two minutes or whatever the case may be. Bulb timer, basically bulb just means the shutter's open. So if you want to shoot star trails, it's a good thing. Shutter mode, I keep my shutter on mechanical. Of course you have, you know, first curtain electronic, regular electronic. There are certain benefits to shooting electronic, but I like the faster sensor readout speed with mechanical. And I think there's also a difference in the bit rate. So if you shoot mechanical, you're getting, getting 14 bit RAWs. And if you shoot electronic, you're getting 12 bit RAWs. Personally, whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't think your eye can see the difference between 14 and 12. I usually stick to mechanical shutter. I like the sound of it. The only time I would go to electronic is if I'm doing a long exposure and you don't want the clank clank of the shutter shaking the camera. And then of course you'd have your camera on a tripod. And then of course you turn off IS or in-body image stabilization. So there's no movement in the sensor, it's just locked in place. Camera's on a tripod, electronic shutter, take your long exposure and it'll look nice and sharp. Okay, number seven, touch shutter. So basically a touch shutter when you have this enabled will allow you to touch the back of the LCD screen and the camera will shoot a shot. If you need that setting on, turn it on. You can also disable it on the, the camera, on the back of the screen, it'll have that little icon which you can touch to turn it off and on. I usually keep it off because I don't want the camera taking shots every time I accidentally touch the screen. So disabled. Image review, I have this off. There are certain times when I keep it on and that's when I shoot in studio. So basically with these modern mirrorless cameras, you can see the exposure through the EVF or the LCD as you're taking it so you know exactly what it's going to look like. And that only works when you're shooting with natural light, right? So constant lights. The moment you go into shooting with studio lights, obviously the <laughs> when the light flashes, it's going to be a lot brighter than what you're seeing with your own eyes or on the back of the LCD. So in that case, you're going to have to chimp and take a look at your shots to make sure you have the right exposure. In that case, I will turn on the image review. But most of the time, I keep it off. Now exposure simulation, this is important if you shoot with any kind of studio lights. So like we mentioned earlier, when you're looking through your EVF and LCD, the camera is going to give you a representation of what your exposure is going to look like. And when you shoot with studio strobes, obviously they're going to be a lot brighter. But if you're shooting, if you're looking through your viewfinder in a studio and you have your aperture set to f8 ISO 100, which is probably where you're going to be if you're shooting in studio, everything is going to look super dark through your EVF and LCD because your aperture is closed down, your ISO is really low, and you're shooting indoors, right? So what you want to do is disable exposure simulation and your camera is just going to give you a generic view of what you're seeing through here so you can compose your shot. And then when you take your shot, if you have image review on, you'll see what everything looks like after the camera takes the shot. So. If you're shooting in studio with studio strobes, make sure exposure simulation is off. If you're shooting with natural light, make sure it's on. All right, next up we have shooting info display settings. Let's get in there. Okay, so here we have settings which we can use. It just changes things visually, how you wanna set things up. So screen info settings. So these are the different screens you have on your LCD. When you hit the info button on the back of the camera, it'll cycle through these different screens. So if you don't want to see this screen where you have all this information, you can turn that off. If you don't want to see a dark screen with the screen off, you can turn that off. If you know, like for example, if you're shooting events and you want to save battery life, you can turn screen off on and then you can just cycle to that screen mode. So your screen isn't always on while the camera's at your side and you're waiting for something to happen. Save a little battery life. And then this is like, I never use this mode that has all the information. So usually I turn that off, I turn that off. This mode I use, this mode I use, you know, these are all good for me. So let's get out of here. We hit okay and out. Now, VF info toggle settings. So these are the settings or the screens you can see inside the EVF. Here are your different options. Here you have your histogram and your level. Here you have some info and here you just have a clean screen. You know, so that's great. Let's keep that one on. Okay, and VF, vertical display. So I think that is your viewfinder. So when you're shooting horizontal, you have your numbers and your information at the bottom of the screen. But then when you turn your camera uh, vertically to shoot a portrait, all your information is gonna be on the right, but you want it at the bottom. So this will line everything up on the bottom. So you turn that on. Grid display. So you can have a clean screen with nothing on it, or you can have a grid display with a rule of thirds. So you have a three by three grid. You can have a six by four grid, which I use when I shoot architectural stuff because I want to make sure the walls and everything is lined up horizontally, vertically, so everything's visually appealing. And then you have your three by three grid with X lines. So I usually keep things on three by three because I love using the rule of thirds for composition. I find that visually pleasing and appealing to me. 
Obviously, everyone's got a different style, so you can use whatever setting you want. You know, it'd be really cool in the future if Canon allowed you to upload your own grid. If you can take like a PNG file and load it into your camera and then have your custom grid here, that would be so awesome. Okay, so anyway, three by three grid, histogram display brightness. So you can set up a histogram to appear on your screen and you can set it to show the brightness of the image, black to white, or you can show RGB. Useful display size setting, I keep it on large. You can have it on small, large. All right, let's get out of here. All right, now for everyone's favorite, autofocus. So AF operation one shot. I don't know why I have it on one shot. Usually I have it on servo. So the difference between one shot and servo, you probably already know this if you're buying an R5. One shot is when you depress the shutter, it'll focus on something. And then when you push the button down half or all the way, it'll take the shot. So it only focuses while the button is pushed halfway. So if your subject matter is moving erratically closer further, if by the time you push it from halfway to all the way down, the subject is moved, you're going to be out of focus, especially if you're shooting with like an RF 1.2. Servo, on the other hand, means whatever your focus point is on is constantly focusing. So I want to keep it on that. AF method, you have all your different methods here. Horizontal, vertical, AF. You can read about this in the instruction manual. If you want to track eyes, obviously you go into tracking mode. And then I like spot mode. I don't really use any of the others unless I'm in video. Like I'll use horizontal AF if I'm in video. But usually it is on tracking. And then subject to detect people, animals, vehicles, or none. And Canon is really cool. If you have your subject to detect as vehicles, it won't track people's eyes. So if somebody comes into the shot, the camera will still track the vehicle or if it's tracking the animal or people. Now, the one thing I ran into is if I'm shooting video, for example, for YouTube and I want to display a product, the camera will keep tracking my eyes even if I put the product in front of the frame. So if that's something you do for those shots, you want to take uh, your subject to detect and set it to none, in which case the camera will focus on whatever's closest or whatever's in the, the sensor spot or whatever the position where it's going to be focusing. It'll focus on whatever's closest to the camera. So just something to keep in mind. But for photography, generally, if you shoot people, you want it on people tracking. Eye detection enabled. You can disable it if you want. You can also accidentally disable it. So here we go. If we hit info, see we can accidentally disable eye tracking here by hitting the info button while we're in the Q menu. So that's just something to keep in mind. So you may think you turned on eye tracking, but in essence it's disabled. A continuous AF. So this is different from AI servo in the sense that when you have it enabled, let's do let's say we have the camera on spot focusing. If you're walking around and you have the camera by your side, it's going to continuously focus on whatever's on that focus point. So you're kind of wasting your battery because the camera just continually just focuses on whatever's in front of it. Technically, you want to disable it. So when you don't have the shutter depressed, it's not focusing on anything that saves battery. However, if you're shooting video content uh, and like I'm a hybrid shooter, so I keep this enabled simply because when I'm in video mode, if I'm not recording, the camera won't focus on me. So I'll be blurry and then I have to go and touch the button so it focuses on me and if I move, I'm here. So it just for tracking and just like checking my screen to make sure what's in focus, the camera's always focusing on something. So in video mode, I like to keep it enabled, but for photography, I would keep it disabled. Touch and drag settings. Now this is important. All right, touch and drag AF enabled. You can disable it if you want, keep it enabled. And what this allows you to do is set up a portion of the screen here. So when you have your eye to the EVF, you can use your thumb to change your focus mode. Now, I know a lot of people talk about, oh, the joystick, the joystick, but it's actually a lot faster to use the back of your screen with a thumb to move your focus point around than it is to use the joystick to move the focus point around. Even though the joystick on the R5 is amazing, it's fast and it's very responsive. It's like a video game controller. Touching the back of the screen is just way faster. So if you're shooting a live event like a wedding and you wanna be able to move your focus point around quickly, turn this on. I suggest you set up the right side of the screen to be touch activated. Obviously, you can set the left, the top, the bottom, bottom right, whatever. As <laughs> if your nose gets in the way and touches the screen by accident, you can set it up so your nose won't affect the screen. So keep it on right. And then the other thing too is you can set it to relative or absolute. So absolute means like, let's say this is your touch area on the screen, you touch the top right, the focus will go to the top right. If you touch the bottom left of your screen, it'll go to the bottom left. Relative is basically you swipe the screen anywhere and the focus point will move relative to the direction of your swipe, which to me is a lot faster and more responsive, so I keep it on relative. Manual focus peaking settings. So this is if you're using vintage lenses and you want to manually focus, you can turn peaking on. 
You can change the color. No, oh, that's level, that's color. So basically when you focus, anything that's in focus will be like, for me right now, I have it set to blue. So if I'm focusing on the model's eyes, they'll turn blue and I know that the vintage lens is in focus. So that's focus peaking. That's probably a separate video if you wanna shoot with uh, vintage lenses. Focus guide, you can turn that on and off. It'll kind of give you a little display to let you know if you're in focus or not. Focus assist beam. This will fire a little light from inside the camera to help the camera focus in dark situations. All right, so now we have servo AF. And here's all your different case scenarios. So you can set it up. Versatile multi-purpose, continuous to track subjects, ignore possible obstacles. I have this on because I want it to track whatever I'm tracking. And if something comes in front of it, I don't want it to you know, miss focus. So for me, I shoot weddings. If I'm focusing on the bride and someone walks in front of the frame, I don't want the camera to jump to this new person and track them while the bride's over there. Doesn't make any sense, right? And here we have instantly focus on subjects suddenly entering the point. This is great for sports if you want to change points. Case number four, for subjects that accelerate, decelerate quickly, also great for sports. Auto, the camera will decide for you. Personally, I just keep it on case two, but obviously you can do whatever suits your style of photography. Let's get out of here. Limit AF methods. So if, if you don't want to have this as an option, you can turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. You know, and let's say you just want these three, you can just leave those three on. So here you can kind of select what you want or don't want. I just, I just keep them all on, but honestly, I just use these two methods. And then orientation, AF point linked to orientation. So how this works is let's say you have, using the rule of thirds, and your top left intersection is where you're focusing and you switch your camera to vertical mode. Will the camera understand that's in vertical mode and then switch that focus point to the top left in vertical mode? Or will it keep it relative to where it was in horizontal? I like to keep it uh, vertic and vertical and horizontal the same. I don't really like my focus point moving automatically when I switch from horizontal to vertical, simply because if I'm shooting quickly at a wedding and I wanna go here, all of a sudden my focus point is somewhere else on the screen and then I have to find it and then I have to move it to where I want it and it just slows me down. So when I keep it on both, I know it's gonna be here on the left side. So when I go vertical, I know it's gonna be at the bottom. So I just swipe it up and boom, take the shot. It makes me shoot a lot faster. So I just keep it on both. All right, next up we have highlight alerts and I definitely recommend you enable this. This is super important. Basically, if you take a shot and you're overexposed, when you play back the, the image on your camera, anything that's overexposed will blink black to white, black to white, black to white, and you know it's overexposed. So if, if you're shooting in tricky lighting situations, hit the playback button, take a look at your image, camera will let you know if something's overexposed. Now, a bit of a side rant, we're gonna take a second here. Canon, if you're listening, please make highlight alert a live feature so that if I'm looking through my EVF and I'm composing a shot, it'll tell me in live, in real time, that, hey, listen, your highlights are blown out, your sky's blown out, the clouds are blown out, or whatever the case may be, so that I can make an exposure correction in camera before I take the shot, instead of having to slow down, look in the, hit the playback button, look at the image and see if something's overexposed, right? So, Canon, please make this highlight alert live. Zebras, blinking, colors, whatever the case may be, give us some sort of alert. All right. Okay, next up in the uh, the wrench tab, we have beep. We can turn beep on and off. So if you wanna hear your beep, <laughs> you can turn it on. If you don't wanna hear the beep, you can turn it off. I've been a photographer for 19 years. I've heard way too many beeps, so I keep it off. Also, if you're shooting event events and weddings or things like that where you don't wanna distract people, you would definitely wanna keep that off. Power saving. I have my display offset to 30 minutes because I shoot video. And when I'm shooting a YouTube video and the screen turns off and I can't see what I'm doing and it just it bothers me. So I set it to 30 minutes. Obviously for photography, you want to set it to like 15 seconds. You know, if you put down the camera and walk away, the screen doesn't need to be on. So uh, yeah, that's the one difference between photo and video. Auto power off, I have it to one minute. Viewfinder off, one minute. Although I could probably set those a little higher when I do video work, but uh, that's just something to keep in mind. And also eco mode, I have it set to off because when you're shooting video, you don't want the camera. Like if I check my script and then came back and all of a sudden the camera shuts down because it's in eco mode and then I have to turn it on and it's just a pain. So in photography mode, definitely keep eco mode on. In video mode, keep it off. Now, if you wanna see my screen brightness, I have it set to four, viewfinder brightness two, screen viewfinder color tone two, you can go in here and you can adjust the color tones and different things, up to you, it's all personal preference, whatever you wanna do. Now this is what I was talking about earlier. The shutter comes down, but you have to turn it on. 
You can set it to be open when you turn off the camera. You can set it to close when you turn off the camera. Obviously, I want it closed because it protects the sensor from dust. But keep in mind, do not ever, ever, under any circumstances, touch that, that shutter. Like, don't touch it because it's like paper-thin metal and you'll bend it and you'll break it and it's over. I remember one time there was dust inside my camera and I, I blew in there to blow the dust out and a little bit of saliva went in and landed on the shutter. <laughs> I grabbed, out of instinct, I grabbed like a little lens cloth and I was gonna wipe it and I was like, no, 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 no. Don't wipe it. I just put a little fan blowing a little air. So I just left it and I let it evaporate on its own. And you can actually see that little, <laughs> little bit of where the saliva dried on the shutter, but the shutter still works, there's no issue. So if you end up doing that by accident, don't wipe it. Don't touch it, just let it evaporate and that's it. Sensor cleaning. So I learned something interesting about sensor cleaning watching a YouTube video the other day. And when you go to sensor cleaning mode, it'll actually pixel map the sensor. So if you have any hot pixels or dead pixels or something like that, it'll kind of find them and it'll take the information from the pixel next to it and use that to recalibrate the data for that missing pixel. And it'll kind of correct for dead pixels as well as knocking dust off the sensor, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know that before. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've seen a couple of videos talking about that. So I assume that's how it works. So that's pretty cool. That's an awesome feature. You can clean manually, obviously, if you clean your sensor manually, which isn't hard, you gotta get the right swabs and the alcohol. You set it to clean manually. I'll make a video about this. If you guys wanna know, let me know in the comments below. And you know, you have to set it so the shutter goes up and doesn't come down and you clean your sensor and then you hit the button. And I don't want, I don't know if this will interrupt the screen recording or not, which is why I don't wanna do it here. Okay, so what else is important in the menu? All right, so we have custom shooting modes. Now you have C1, C2, C3 for photo mode. And also if you switch the menu to video mode, you have C1, C2, C3 for video mode. So you have six custom settings, three for photo, three for video. And basically you set up your settings, whatever you have here, and then you go register settings, you set it to what you want to register to it, you set it and it'll update. Uh, I can make a whole video talking about that if you want. I don't really don't want to play around with it here because I have my settings set the way I want them. So now we have copyright information and this is kind of cool. You can uh, go here and you can enter your copyright details. So I have my name and my website on here. So if my raw files get out there and someone's trying to claim that those are their raw files and not my raw files and you know, it can become messy. Some people, you never know. There's scammers out there all over the place. So you can put your information into the EXIF data. So if anyone tries to claim that they shot it, hey, it was shot with your camera because your EXIF data is on there and you can prove that the raw files are actually yours. Okay, so now we are in the custom settings and I will make a video talking about my custom settings and how I set the custom buttons up because that's a whole other video and this video is already long enough. We've gone through a lot of things here. So you have this setting, these settings here where you can customize your buttons and things, which is pretty cool. All right, and finally you have your star tab and this is pretty cool. You can have multiple tabs within here, which is awesome. So I have one for setup, one for video, one for, it's called menu one, the other one's called natural light. And none of these are actually set up properly. I just started throwing random things in there. I have to take my time to set it up properly, but you can set up different menu tabs with the options you need for your different shooting. So if you have certain settings that you turn off and on for weddings, you can set up a tab for that. Here I have one trying to set one up for light, but I never use it. Honestly, I just try and remember where everything is in the menu rather than using the star menu setting because then you rely on this this little setup that you create for yourself and you forget where everything actually is in the menu. So yeah, I mean, use it if you want, no big deal. It's, uh, it's pretty handy if you wanna just have a bunch of settings that you change often in one place. So there you go. Oh, and there's one more thing I wanna talk about here. Where was it? I think it was in the wrench icon. Ah, uh, here it is, save load cam settings to card. Have a video about that there. So you can actually take your custom settings from your camera, load it onto an SD card, and save it. So if you accidentally, let's say, you have to send your camera into repair and you have to get a loaner, you can take those settings, pop it into your new R5 and upload those settings into your camera. Or let's say you're shooting a wedding with an assistant who also has an R5 and you wanna make sure that the settings are the same on both cameras, the time and everything is the same, just take the memory card, take your settings, plug it into the other camera, upload the settings and boom, you're done. So it's, it's great. And the other thing too is you can save multiple settings. So you can have settings for weddings, settings for video, settings for, I don't know, beach portraits, settings for whatever you do. You can have different settings for your camera, load them all onto a memory card and then pop it under your camera and load up whatever settings you want. You can name them. I think maximum eight characters per name. So yeah, that's a really cool feature. 
All right, we are done, and that was a long one. That was a long one. I got to stretch after that. I got to stand up. But anyway, this is the EOS R5 menu settings from the perspective of a photographer who shoots photos for a living. Hopefully that was valuable to you, and if it was, definitely leave a comment down below. I'll give this video a thumbs up. I'm trying hard to grow this channel, and I appreciate all the interaction I can get so that we can get to 50,000 subscribers. That's the next goal. But with that being said, if you want to see more R5 content, definitely check out my channel. I got more there. Also, I'm going to put a blog post link down below, and on my blog, I have all my R5 content, including sample photos, photo shoots, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to see some cool photos taken with this camera as well as other content, definitely check out the blog link down below. And with that being said, this video is over. Thank you for watching. Really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out.